Welcome to the fourth unit of NASA and the Sailor Foundation Space System Engineering course, Scoping and Concept of Operations. The unit objectives for this unit include define the scope of a system and its importance, identify the dimensions that comprise a system's scope, describe a real-world scope example, explain the importance of having a concept of operations. Unit 4.1, Scope. There's a significant amount of thought that has to go into what is the intent of the mission. You see some pictures here, and you know there's a lot of key stakeholders and in the NASA community. Many times those are scientists or government leaders who have some ideas of some big scientific question they'd like to have answered or some specific area of research that they'd like to have done. And, that, and that's great. I mean, those ideas are the genesis of what become NASA missions and NASA discoveries, but they need to be able to communicate, those stakeholders, those scientists and, and government personnel need to be able to communicate those um, ideas to engineers and an engineering team that's going to be able to take that idea and turn it into a real spacecraft and a real mission uh, that can make the measurements, return the data, and be able to do the discoveries um, that they, they want to be able to do. So at NASA, this initial communication between scientists and engineers is aided by the use of a structure called the scoping exercise. So let's hear a little bit more about this initial interaction between scientists and engineers from Dr. Mather and Goddard's chief scientist, Jim Garvin, and then we're going to discuss the specific elements of a scoping exercise. How do you get to do a big project? Well, first you have an idea. Uh, then you say, well, I better talk to some people because I couldn't possibly do this idea by myself. So usually it's a scientist that has this kind of idea. So a scientist finds some friends to talk to and we draw sketches and we say, what if we could do this and what if we could do that? Well, I'm Jim Garvin, I'm the chief scientist here at NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center. Great job. Uh, my job is strategic. We have a large workforce of scientists who study the cosmos, the Earth, here at Goddard. and my job is to help them form strategies for new science questions to ask, new missions to fly, new experiments to develop, to help NASA do its job to explore really this universe we live in. Scientists have ideas. Engineers make ideas practical. Um, we try to measure the unmeasurable, but the engineers tell us what, how unmeasurable is it. You just heard Dr. Garvin and Dr. Mather talk a lot about how scientists have all these great ideas that they like to accomplish they then have to work with an engineering team to figure out how do you accomplish that. And so uh, one of the first steps in that process is learning from the scientists exactly what do they want to do. So um, at NASA that can take many forms and we have uh, a National Academy of Sciences for instance in the U.S. that uh, sits around and a lot of scientists will get together to try to define what are the highest priority things that we want to do in the future and uh, they again don't know anything about how you would actually do it or whether it's even achievable or not but they at least have the ideas of what are those next big challenges, those next big questions in science that need to be answered. So um, to start off, let's kind of go through this thing. It's called the scoping exercise. So let's go through this scope and what is a scope of a mission. And so the idea here is if you start to look through this process, um, we're going to walk through it piece by piece. And so the first piece you see here is a need. So the first part of defining the scope of a mission is to define its need. So need in a lot of cases will be something like Dr. Mather talked about. It might be that scientists would like to do some kind of research. Um, uh, Mars exploration by NASA was driven for many years by the idea of finding out whether Mars was ever a habitable planet or not. So the need might be let's try to figure out if Mars ever could have sustained life or let's try to find planets outside of the uh, solar system. That may be a very high level need that a scientist has. So a need is a very high level statement. It rarely changes throughout the life of this mission development cycle, but it's something that you have to lay out right up front so that everybody understands what is it we're trying to do with the system that we're going to be building. The next step, if you see, we're going to go across the top here, is you're going to break that down into a little bit lower level of detail for this specific mission. What are its goals, right? So it says goals are some fundamental aim that you expect to accomplish in order to, to fulfill the need. So, okay, well, maybe there's this high-level need that says I want to be able to explore Mars and find whether it was ever habitable. Well, maybe I have a goal that says I'd like to find out if there was ever water on Mars. Okay, well, finding water might give you clues as to whether Mars could have been habitable. So you can kind of see the connection of need as a very high-level statement. A goal is something a little bit lower level. And what you're trying to get to is the point where you can now define a specific spacecraft at some point 
to do these things, to accomplish these goals, to meet this need. And so a need and a goal are the first two, two things that are defined. And again, this is where the science community, if it's a NASA mission uh, in science, are really critical to helping you understand what needs to be done at this point. You follow along the top, the next step is to define objectives for the mission. So uh, there might be more than one, there might be more than one goal as well, but so you see objectives in plural here. So it says objectives are initiatives that implement the goal and define how the goal can be met. So this is again another lower level of detail and so the process of finding water may have a number of objectives. So if one of the objectives might be to search in certain areas of Mars where there have been signs from Earth of water. So it might be certain plateaus or certain areas, certain canyons that might have to be explored that if you can meet that objective of exploring those areas, you have a good chance of meeting the goal of finding water, which is gonna help you in meeting the need of finding whether Mars was at one point habitable or not. So needs, goals, and objectives all kind of fit together. But again, just like a lot in system engineering, we're trying to break things down to a lower level, lower level of detail, so that you can then figure out in the end, how are you gonna build an actual spacecraft to meet the, to make this all happen? So, so okay, so let's go across, and uh, we've defined needs, goals, and objectives. There are a number of other things that you want to do in this scoping process. Again, this is early in the development process. One of them is to define assumptions. So uh, it says here assumptions include levels of technology, partnerships, and extensibility to other missions. So at the beginning, you're trying to define some terms that everyone's going to use as far as, uh, gee, I assume that if I look out at Mars, that there would be water somewhere. And so I assume I could find it if I have the right technology to do it. Um, if I look out at stars out, out, uh, outside our solar system, in, in the case of the mission that I work on, you might say, well, gee, if I look at enough stars, I'm bound to find a planet sooner or later. Well, that's an assumption. I don't know that that's going to come true. And a lot of science is all about making assumptions that if I build the right instrumentation, I can actually go off and, and, and figure out these big problems. They're not always well defined up front. You don't know that you're going to really be able to succeed, but you have some assumptions going in about if I have a certain sensitivity of instrument, I will be able to accomplish uh, the needs, goals, and objectives. The next one is to start to define a specific mission. Now, this is at a very high level. So remember, you're early in the process, so you don't know that it's going to be a rover on Mars and it's going to look like the Curiosity rover yet. But what you might say is, gee, I've got this uh, need to go off and um, find whether Mars was habitable. I, I've got a goal of looking for water. I've got these objectives of looking in certain valleys. I'm going to probably have to do that on the surface, so I'm going to, and I'm going to have to look around. I can't just go to one spot and land. So I'm going to define the mission at a very high level to say I'm going to need to put a rover on the surface, and I'm going to need to explore a certain amount of territory to have the best chance of being able to accomplish what I've set out to accomplish in my needs, goals, and objectives. And so the mission description at this point that you're going to define is just in a very general term. You know what is the kind of mission that you're going to use to uh, meet these needs, goals, and objectives. The next one you'll see that comes up on the bottom is operational concept. And so not only knowing that you've got this mission that you want to perform, you want to also know how will it operate? What's, uh, what's this going to actually look like when I build it and operate it? And so an operations concept is just a high level view. A lot of times it's a picture, kind of walks you through from the beginning to the end. What will be the phases I'll go through in operating this mission? If I'm going to Mars, I've got to launch and go there. I've got to land on the surface. I've got to be able to rove around. I've got to be able to send information back. And so I'm starting to lay out at a very high level, what's this operations concept look like? How's this thing going to operate? And again, you're not going into a lot of detail. In the scoping exercise, you're just really trying to drive out very high level requirements and high level needs as you're walking through. So the next step, and you see it in the lower right, is constraints. So in all projects that NASA undertakes, there are always constraints. Sometimes those are fiscal constraints. A lot of the missions we bid, uh, they're capped. So there's a certain amount of money available for the mission. Sometimes it's only $200 million, sounds like a lot. Sometimes it's a billion dollars or more. But in any case, there's usually some constraint that says, I can't go above that level or I'm not gonna be able to accomplish this mission. So I have to kind of budget to make sure that I can stay within that level. Now, when it uh, comes to going to Mars, there's only opportunities to go to Mars every 18 months or so. You have to wait until the Earth and, the, and Mars are aligned in their orbit 
to be able to send a rocket there most efficiently to get, to get a spacecraft there. So one of the constraints I would have on a Mars mission would be to say, I can only launch at these specific times in these specific years, and if I can, I'm going to have to wait another 18 months and I can't afford to do that. That's going to cost me money to store the spacecraft. So I have a constraint on when I have to be ready to go to the launch pad. There could be all other kinds of technical constraints that are levied on the mission. There could be programmatic constraints. There could be regulatory constraints where, you know, maybe there's um, uh, constraints in, uh, on, a, on a mission that carries a nuclear device. We have a lot of nuclear power generators, and so there's a lot of regulatory constraints on how we have to handle those on the ground and how we have to build them to make sure that they're safe for people during the development cycle. So, so there could be all kinds of constraints that come into play while you're developing a system. Last one here in the middle is authority and responsibility. So when you lay out at the beginning and you start to lay out your mission and how it's going to come together, your project, you also want to know who's going to be responsible for what. Clear lines of roles and responsibilities. Is the spacecraft going to be built by a specific company? Are the scientific instruments going to be built by certain academic institutions and who are they? And who's going to be responsible for making that it all comes, uh, making sure that it all comes together to form an operational system? Who are the system engineers going to be on this mission? Are they going to be from a NASA center? Are they going to be from another institution? So laying out in the end, and you know, who's responsible for funding? Who's responsible for oversight and making sure that you're making progress on schedule? So all of that has to be done up front to make sure that as the team starts to move forward, and these are sometimes very large teams, diverse around the world that everyone knows exactly what their role is in accomplishing the mission. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take this idea of scoping and we're going to go through an example of the Apollo missions back in the 1960s. But if I were to say, my fellow citizens, that we shall send to the moon 240,000 miles away from the control station in Houston a giant rocket more than 300 feet tall, the length of this football field, made of new metal alloys, some of which have not yet been invented, capable of standing heat and stresses, several times more than have ever been experienced, fitted together with a precision better than the finest watch, carrying all the equipment needed for propulsion, guidance, control, communications, food, and survival, on an untried mission to an unknown celestial body, and then return it safely to Earth, re-entering the atmosphere at speeds of over 25,000 miles per hour, causing heat about half that on the temperature of the sun, almost as hot as it is here today, and do all this, and do all this, and do it right, and do it first, before this dictate is out, then we must be bold. Let's Let's kind of use a real world example here. So taking what President Kennedy just talked about, uh, let's take the Apollo program as an example. So uh, we're going to go through the whole scoping exercise and we'll start out with the needs, goals, and objectives. You saw a presidential directive being laid out as a high level need. And so, you know, if you look at that speech, it doesn't exactly tell you how to build the vehicles and accomplish the mission, but it does say that the president would like NASA to accomplish certain goals within this decade. So. Uh, so you see on this chart, you could do the scoping exercise, and you start out with uh, the need here. The need is defined as you want to be able to counter a Soviet military threat. You know, this is a Cold War period. You see a lot of uh, technological accomplishments at this time. President Kennedy's speech is done in an environment where you're uh, starting to see Soviet launches into orbit, and there's a th this perceived threat of this technology that they're developing. So that could be your high-level need statement. So, But that's, again, not enough to build a mission from. So... From that, you go down to a lower level and you say, okay, well, how about a, a goal? What would be a good goal that would fit under that need and, and uh, define an Apollo mission? So, so you have demonstrate U.S. technological superiority in space. And so uh, that takes that down to a little bit lower level. And then from there, you work on objectives, more specific objectives that you might be able to accomplish that will fit into your goal and need. And so here you see a couple. One is make a decisive move in the uh, conquest of space as a society. And then a much more specific objective to send humans to the moon and return them safely by the end of the decade. And so from there, you can start to develop your mission. Another key element of a scoping exercise is an ops concept. And so let's go through for Apollo, what was their operational concept? And the operational concept was multifaceted. It consisted of first launching the crew and the lunar lander from the Earth um, on a multi-stage rocket that would send it into a trajectory that would go to the moon. 
the crew will uh, leave their capsule, go down to the surface, and be able to uh, collect rocks and soil samples and do other scientific investigations. They'll return back to lunar orbit when they're finished, rendezvous with their return vehicle, and then the crew will take that return vehicle, fly back the 250,000 miles to Earth, and enter the atmosphere and be recovered. And so that ops concept really starts to show you a little bit about how this mission could be accomplished, and it starts to divide, define some of what we'll talk about in another module, which will be the high-level requirements for how this whole system has to be able to operate to accomplish the needs, goals, and objectives and what you saw in this whole scoping exercise. So there's other elements of the scoping exercise that we talked about, including assumptions. And so for Apollo, one assumption is that humans could survive space travel for the duration of a lunar mission, a potential for maybe up to a couple weeks that they might have to spend in space. Now, when President Kennedy made that speech, uh, there hadn't been many space flights, and in the U.S. there hadn't been very many at all. And so could somebody survive that long? That was an assumption you made that there could be systems developed to keep a crew alive in microgravity and in the vacuum of space and in the harsh radiation environment for that long. So another assumption is, and again, at the time the president gave that speech, there were no vehicles, uh, rockets, uh, able to be able to carry crew and cargo from the Earth to the moon. And so you made an assumption that given enough money and, um, and enough smart people, you could actually make that happen. So for every one of the uh, missions that you set out to design, you're going to have these um, assumptions you're going to make that may or may not prove to be true. So uh, another part of a scoping exercise is develop your constraints. You want to know going in early on and before you get too deep in here, what are some of the constraints that you have to work within so that the whole team understands uh, some of those boundary conditions. And so you see a, a constraint here that says you have to be able to complete the program within the decade uh, using only American-made components. Okay, so those are two constraints that the design team is going to be under. The, the president asked for this to be done by the end of the decade. And on the other side, there's also um, uh, government rules that said at this time that everything had to be made in America. So you had to make sure that you had suppliers that could provide all the uh, components you would need. Another element of the scoping exercise is authority and responsibility. And in this case, uh, NASA was given the authority by the president and by Congress to uh, execute the mission. And then they de uh, develop rules or roles and responsibilities for each one of the NASA centers to be able to pull the parts together, design the individual pieces to make the mission happen. So there's an example from end to end of going through the whole scoping exercise for a mission, in this case, the Apollo mission. Now click on the icon to read section 4.1, Stakeholder Expectations Definition of the NASA Systems Engineering Handbook. It'd also be helpful to go to page 31 in the handbook to view the diagram of how stakeholder expectations fit into the broader aspect of system design. Once you've completed that reading, please visit the discussion forum.